Hello everyone, I'm Lawrence from Love Equipment and today we have one of Australia's most prominent fitness industry experts, uh, Mr. Justin Tamsit, otherwise known as JT. Um, so our purpose for this interview today is to give insight to you guys as to what might happen next from someone who has seen and is seeing clubs reopen in both Australia and the US. So before we start, Justin, uh, would you please just give us a quick intro of yourself before we go any further? Well, day, everybody. I know that's a very Australian way to say hello, but hello, g'day. Um, yeah, my name's JT. I've been in the fitness industry 30 years. Um, I am a diehard Wallaby fan. And the word on the street is that in 2020, the Wallabies will in fact go undefeated. It's because we're not playing any games. That sounds so, about right, mate. It sounds about right. So we'll, 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 one of our best years in history. Um, 30 years in the industry, club owner, multiple club owner, sold those clubs and when you're unemployed club owner, you become a consultant. And so I've been consulting for about the last 15 years, uh, both here and now in the US. So have been in the UK, spoken at a few of the UK events, Paul Bedford's uh, retention conference, I've spoken there. So I've got an overview of the UK uh, environment and the ecosystem that we call the fitness industry there and currently working with around about uh, 50 individual clients which is a multiple of close to I think nearly 800 clubs uh, in the US so uh, yeah pretty pretty broad spectrum from working with PTs here in Australia to 50 60 club owner uh, franchises uh, individual operators sorry in the US. So hopefully um, I can give some insight because obviously there are some clubs in the US that have already opened and been open for a couple of weeks. Uh, here in Australia, it looks like by the end of the month, every gym will be open in some way, shape or form yeah. in Australia. In fact, on Monday, which will be the 8th of, uh, of June, whenever you're watching this, the, the 8th of June, Western Australia will, in fact, be business as usual with numbers going through there. So we're a little bit ahead of the UK, I think, on that, on that uh, reopening. Yeah, no, 100%, um, which is why your insight, I think, could be absolutely fantastic for franchise owners, directors, um, looking to start but the preparation for, hopefully, when we, when we start to find out, which is one of my questions in a minute. So I guess we'll start off with, with the first question. So can you start by giving us your take um, on the impact coronavirus has had on the fitness industry generally, and then more specifically on Australia and the US? Yeah, sure. So um, look, I've got five, and I really don't think it matters kind of what country we're actually in. I think this is, this is a worldwide impact. So the first one's the obvious one. And that is we've had to change our product offering. Yeah. We've had to go down the route of some sort of digital offering. Uh, now, whether that's classes on demand, whether that's streaming of classes, whether that's Zoom personal training or Zoom training, we've had to go that route. We're always going to do it as an industry, but we've, had, we've been forced to do it a lot faster than probably we, we expected. Um, of course, that now means, though, that we are competing with Peloton, Absolutely. you know, $120 million business that's out there producing content on a daily basis. We're competing with Chris Hemsworth, who's developing his center app and had 500,000 downloads of his app in one month alone. Uh, so we're competing in that space, but we've had, to, we've had to add that to our service offering. The second big impact that we've seen um, during COVID is that when the reality that when we come out of it, everybody that works for us is going to have a new job. The jobs are going to be different, which in the UK is great if you own a recruitment company because there's probably people going to be looking for new staff. Do you know anyone? I, I, I've heard of somebody that, that, that they're great apparently, but um, I'll look them up for you, mate. Well, if you need anyone, I know a company, they're called Love Recruitment. They're pretty Thank good. You. But the reality is, you know, people are going to have to do, their, their jobs are going to be different. Now, some are going to be happy with that and some are going to be unhappy with that. So the impact for us in our businesses is we not only have we seen um, 
kind of people's true colors while we've been closed. We're also going to see their true er colors when we reopen. And it's really going to test their core values to see if they match our core values as a business. When we start asking our group fitness instructors to help clean or our personal trainers to help clean or our receptionists, our people on our welcome desk to be, to have to wear a mask if that becomes mandatory in some counties or, or shires in the UK. Yeah. We don't know yet what that's going to look like, but that's the reality. So Absolutely. jobs are going to change and people are going to accept that if they want a, a job. The third one um, is really an unknown impact on the industry. And, and we really don't know what the future of functional training is going to be. And the reason why I pick functional training first and foremost is the equipment sharing. And we, yeah. if we look at a lot of fitness studios, which like I grew up doing an old fashioned circuit. <laughs> so that's where we all shared equipment. You know, but I also grew up when there was the magic sponge on the football field that we all sucked on. And we've so so like, gyms have put functional training stuff into gyms over the last three to five years, haven't they? There's been a big surge towards that. Correct. Yeah. So we don't know what that's going to look like, Lawrence, moving forward about the sharing of equipment. We don't know what it's going to look like with group personal training and the sharing of equipment. And we don't know what it's going to look like for cycle classes for boxing classes. And what about the poor part of our industry, which is the Muay Thai um, boxing and wrestling part of the industry? Absolutely. Just, we can't predict what that's going to be like because of social distancing and how long that's going to be. Um, and what we have to do, obviously, to, to comply with government rules and regulations. So that's beyond our control, but that will have an impact on our product offering again. Yeah, absolutely. I could not agree more. Yeah. The fourth one is, and this is a hard one, I think, for lots of people to, to kind of conceptualise, um, but the reality is not everyone's going to reopen. When we come out of this, yeah. not everyone's going to reopen. And there are going to be some that are going to reopen and they probably shouldn't reopen, and in three months' time, they won't be open. But to come out of this is going to be hard work. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. And so you've got to have some energy. You've got to have your batteries on full. And if coming into this, your batteries were empty, and I'm just talking about your personal energy. I'm not even talking about your, your bank balance. There are going to be people that are just going to pull, pull up stumps. They're just going to say, I, I don't want to reopen. So the impact on the industry is we're going to see some people just simply not be there, which means how they communicate with their members, who knows? Will they communicate to their members? Who knows? But the gyms that are 150 to 200 square metres, some of them won't open. Some of the 2,000 square metre clubs may not reopen because they've just been hammered with rent. That's and then the last... Sorry. Sorry? It was such a good point. The energy people bring on the restart. It's crucial, isn't it? It's a really good point. Absolutely. We've got to have personal energy to just come out of the blocks and really drive the business moving forward. Yeah. That's going to be hard work. Absolutely. Mate. And then the last one, which I think is a really important one, that I think is probably not spoken about by hardly anybody, but it's a reality. And the impact of COVID has, has been on the mental health of business owners, department leaders, department managers, as well as staff. What we saw when clubs closed all around the world is staff going through the grieving phase. First of all, we were upset. Then we were angry. And then we were frustrated. And in Australia at the moment, our frustration has finally been relieved by being given an open day. But if you speak to anyone in Ireland, as an example, you know, they're being told they're not going to open until August. So there's no frustration there. It's just pure anger. Mm -hmm. So what's happened for everybody in our industry who loves our industry, who got into our industry to change people's lives, they're going through an emotional roller coaster. 
And that in itself can be draining for us. And I think that is the toll. And by the way, I think that's every industry. I don't think that's just the fitness industry. I think that's, but I think it's a, it's a, um, it's a condition, if that's the right word, that no one has really talked about. We talk about it for our members, but we don't actually turn the mirror on ourselves. And I think that's been a big impact. Like I, I work with a bunch of people that we, we connect with every single week for 90 minutes, club owners, and we, and we probably spend the first 30 minutes counselling each other yeah. before we actually talk about the business and what we need to do for the business because we literally have watched people grieve, anger, frustration, sadness yeah. over this eight to 10 week period. That's no, so true. Most of I have the first, the first part of it is just catching up and seeing how people are. Completely agree. Really great insights there, buddy. Really thank you for that. Um, taking on one step further. So um, where, where are the Australian US fitness markets at right now in terms of clubs reopen? Because not everyone in the UK will be aware. Can you give us an idea of where those clubs are at in terms of the openings at the moment? Yeah, and, and you, I hope you can add to this because the big difference between... Um, well, Australia and the US, there's, there's this similarity is that we've got the big federal government making decisions and then we have our individual states making decisions. Yeah. Now, in Australia, we follow the state system. In the US, federal government, state right. governors, individual counties. So the mayor of a county can actually go against what the governor says, who goes against what the president says so i'll give you one classic example in one state in um the u.s the owner of the business is an open trump supporter openly runs trump campaigns has had a trump event at his club um, and he's got one of the nicest clubs in the world the governor of that state well he hates trump despises trump so when he came out with his plan for reopening, health clubs were in stage five wow. for one reason and one reason only. The club owner who supports Trump, he was going to punish. And this was his chance to punish him. So what we're seeing in the US is this political game, really. not about the mental health of our members, not about the economy. The greatest it's about the the political the football. Football. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a great example, isn't it? And that's really sad. Whereas here in Australia, we haven't had that problem. We've, we've, been, we've been guided in our states by our medical experts. And when they think it's ready to go, we're ready to go. Um, and, and so it's been very different. Generally, what we see, though, in the states and here is the staged opening. And so the opening looks like, and I have no idea how they worked out these numbers. But, the, but it looks like it's about 20 people in a room um, per hour. Yeah. And then you've got to get those 20 people out and then 20 people in. And they're there literally for an hour. And in some clubs in the United States, um, people are booking to use that one hour and then they're kicked out. Okay. And there's a queue of people waiting to get in. Um, and then... There's an, then there's this model of 20 people in a gym, but 10 people in a group fitness class. So like I say, I've no idea how they come up with 10 and 20, um, but that seems to be the answer. From 20, it then seems to go to 50 and 50 to 100. Now, we haven't really seen any clubs um, above 100. At 100, it then becomes open slather. Absolutely. It's just not like business as usual. So we're seeing that at the moment uh, as of next Monday in Western Australia, where it's 300 plus in an indoor um, facility, which of course, that's a standard sort of operating day for a gym. They can, they can run it yeah. as per business. So it definitely seems this, this staggered opening. Um, the first people back in clubs tend to be the 18 to 25 year old males. The toughest people to get back, obviously, are the older members. 
but also depending upon what's happening in your society at the time around schooling are women. Women who are that 35, 30 to 45 age group who may or may not be working because if the kids are at home, then they can't get into the gym. So they seem to be a bit slower to come back. Yeah. We are seeing um, particularly, obviously we, we can see this in the US as opposed to here in Australia at this point. We don't have the data here as yet. But we're seeing somewhere between 20 and 50% of members coming back in that first two week period. Okay. So visitation is still pretty strong. Yeah. We also know from data research and, and surveys that have been conducted in the US that again, about 20 to 30% of people say they will be back within 60 days of the club reopening. Okay, that's interesting. But if we, if we add that up, if you're at 20 and 20% say they're coming back, that's only 40% of your members. Yeah. Or if you're at 50 and 30% say they're coming back, that's still only 80% of your members. So the data seems to suggest that that remaining membership base will either never come back or will come back within six months. Okay. So the, but the flip side, which is I think one of the really exciting side signs of reopening is that clubs are selling memberships. Yeah. Like people are joining. Excellent. So in the first, two weeks in the US, some of the clubs that I work with have seen 200% up on sales in May compared to last year. Bearing in mind they were only open for 10 days in May this year. Every inquiry that they had, and okay, that might be an exaggeration, but let's say the majority of inquiries that they had were brand new inquiries. They weren't people in their lead funnel. They weren't people that they'd already spoken to. These were people who walked in and said, I want to join the gym. They paid full price and got no discount because the clubs hadn't pressed any buttons on marketing as yet. It's so all of a sudden the clubs then go, oh, we better start marketing. What offer can we give? Don't give them an offer. People will join anyway. I've, ch I've, ch I've chatted to several operators about this and it seems to be because of this, it's almost created this whole new raft of, of gym users. People didn't really have exercise as part of their lives beforehand, but almost had that enforced exercise. They've built the habit. And now they're looking to channel it somewhere. We've got a whole new group of people that actually might be looking to join clubs. It could be a huge, a huge thing for, for, for the general well-being and fitness of, of, of populations all over the world, but obviously particularly for the fitness industry, people joining clubs, looking for that guidance looking for that support so it could end up being being a really positive thing for, for fitness owners oh 100 percent. but the other interesting thing lawrence is that clubs in the u.s have got rid of trial visits because okay. you've got to track and trace yeah okay such a good point so they get rid of trial visits they get rid of casual visits so if you want to use the gym the only way you can use the gym is by becoming a member now here's the kicker the suburban gyms are killing it. The CBD gyms are the ones that are struggling because everybody's working from home. Yeah, because there's only 10 so people. They're canceling, their gym memberships. they're canceling their gym memberships in the city to use the suburban clubs. So there's going to be a huge uptake of uh, people wanting, particularly when you think about London, yeah. it's too expensive to live in London. So all those outlying suburbs... If you've got a gym in the outlying suburbs of London, be ready. You guys are going to get hammered with new members. Everyone's That's a good home. home. That's exciting. Everyone, yeah, exactly. Everyone's working from home. They're used to. They can work from home now. They can do it. They, they want to go into a city now to be able to do that. Thanks. So, I really have some good points. So that, that's some excellent one so far. So take it one step further. So, um, so the flip side of that, so here in the UK, we're still closed. We haven't had the date yet when we can get back into our gyms. So what advice would you give to franchisees, um, um, directors, owners right now, based on what you know now, based on what you've seen, maybe some of the opening teething problems, what might have happened? You're ahead of us. What can we do? What advice do you have for the UK? The sort of things we should be thinking about now. Okay. First thing, every franchise owner, 
independent gym owner, um, even company club manager needs to understand, independent owner needs to understand, you are not on holidays. <laughs> you are closed, but you are not on holidays. Now is the time to um, get your shit together. <laughs> um, really, you, you've got to be thinking now about what does your business plan look like until the end of the year? Yeah. Now, you guys don't know when you're going to open. We don't know. And in Australia, we didn't know. We were guessing sometime in June, maybe July. You guys might be thinking late June, sometime July. Yeah. What we need to think about is, let's imagine, worst case scenario, like Ireland, you're not going to open until mid-August. So what does your business look like on the 1st of October? And then work backwards to where you are now. And what do you need to put in place so that by the 1st of October, you've got a robust business, that your business is ready to go? Yeah. Now, you can bring that forward. It just means that the time frame has to, you'll have to work faster and you can push it out if you need to. But I think one of the, the real struggles for us in, as entrepreneurs in, in our industry is not having a date. Like it's just an open end. Well, we're going to open at some stage. Well, you're going to be open by October. There's a 99.99% chance October would be it or or November, or maybe you guys know better and it's September. Pick a date and work your plan around that and, and design what your business looks like. You need to be really clear on what product you want to offer when you reopen. So I hate to say this word, I, the word abhors me, but many businesses pivoted to running some sort of digital offering. The question becomes, do you want to continue to offer that digital offering when you reopen and the doors are open? It actually got a physical offering and when you have a digital offering. If you're having a digital, digital offering, to what extent do you want that digital offering? Do you want to compete with Peloton and Mirror or do you just want to have a how you're going sort of program? That's your choice, but you've got to make that decision on what that's going to look like. Peloton are not a fitness company. Peloton are a content company. Yeah. They're executives. The two people that run Peloton work for Disney and work for a network TV station. They're not gym instructors. They're not personal trainers. And so for us, if we're going to go that digital route, then we need to make sure we really understand what that actually means for our business. And we can they make can that decision, decision now. Yeah. We can still be running it now and using it to supplement what we currently offer. But then we need to make the decision, do we want to continue to offer that or not when we reopen? And we can be making that decision while we're closed. We can work on our team. What's really important now is we keep our team engaged for our team's mental health. Yeah. So we can be doing... Friday night Zoom parties with our team. We can be doing staff training. We can be having team workouts. There's so many things we can be doing. We need to keep our team engaged with us and we can offer training. We can be doing, having them listen to a podcast or read a book or watch a TED talk and then we can sit down and talk about it. There's this huge opportunity to be really developing the culture of our business. And what we will see, and we talked about this earlier, is we'll see how people respond. And how people respond now will determine whether you actually want to keep them when you reopen your doors. Yeah, absolutely, buddy. Absolutely. You kind of beat me we to the punch to... Sorry, sorry, go on. Sorry, Jay. Yeah, I've got, sorry, I've got two more. Yeah, yeah crack we on. We need to build our content. So yeah. what is our... And, and what that means is, like, I was just speaking with a gentleman in the UK, actually, and he told me that he analysed 75 businesses in the US, big businesses, fitness businesses in the US. And when COVID hit, their social media content dropped off, substantially decreased. We need to continue to producing content. Yeah, we do. We can't stop communicating with our community. And this is a phrase that I've used a lot 
particularly here in Australia and in the US. So, um, sorry, you guys are the third to hear it. But as club owners and managers, you cannot over-communicate with your members at this time. Even a message that simply says, we don't know what, when we're going to open, is just keeping them updated. It makes them feel that they're still part of your community. And that's the fifth one. We have to keep building our community. The clubs in the US that are coming out of this the strongest with usage and with members coming back and lack of cancellations are the clubs that have the strongest community and worked hard on that community while they were closed Absolutely. by communicating and with good quality content. So we, we just can't drop that ball on building community. Now, if you haven't done anything since you guys sort of closed down, now's the time to make the change. Now's the time to go, let's put together a strategy on developing a community. Let's run a challenge for all of our members. Let's run, get video content for our members. That is what we can do now. And that will mean when we come out of the tunnel, and believe me, at this point in time, you may not think that you're going to come out of the tunnel, but you will. Yeah. And you probably will come out sooner than you think. So, this is, so yeah, that's, so you, so that's clear, that I have. you've clearly seen that you've clearly seen that that has a real impact. The community, the engaging with your members, with your database now has a significant impact on the strength of your business coming out the other side. 100%. 100%. If there's no other takeaways from today, and it's clearly loads more, that's a huge one to be able to take away. So, great, really great point. But, and it, you touched it, my next point is less about the, 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 the owners and the operators, it's more about the guys in club land, the fitness professionals, the club managers, system managers. You touched on it a little bit in your last answer, but you speak at conferences, you do training. You speak so much sense. I saw, I saw you at the end of time fitness conference in Australia. You talked about stuffs, which is still the, one of the best speeches I've heard. Fantastic. What, what advice would you give to fitness professionals now? You mentioned about training TED Talks. What could, what could the guys be doing now to make sure when they come out the other side, they've added real value to themselves? Yeah. What's I think the stuff? first thing that they can do is understand they're not alone. Yeah. You know, um, too many times in business we think it's a, a sign of strength or it's, it's a sign of kudos or it's our ego that we try to get through these really tough times alone. And it's actually okay to put up your hand and say, I need some help. It's okay to, to reach out to someone down the road or in the next town or the next suburb and say, hey, how about we go for coffee and, and let's, let's vent for... 30 minutes on, on how bad things are. And then let's just talk about how we can make things better. So I think the number one thing for me is really to explore the opportunity of help. Um, there are plenty of, of free Facebook groups that you can join to get advice to, to supplement your, your journey on reopening. There are paid opportunities that you can do. And there's stuff that you personally can do to reach out to people and connect and just have conversations. Because I think this is the most important thing that, is that you're not, I know it sounds cliche because we've heard it on TV commercials and through politicians and mental health experts, but you're not alone in this. We're all going through this and we're all going to get through it, but we do need the support of each other. And as owners, we need to be making sure we're giving that support to our team and then as owners, we also need to be getting that support because often we forget about ourselves. We, we give so much to our team to make sure they're okay. We yeah. actually forget about ourselves. So the first thing I think that we, we really need to do is, um, is ask for help if we need it. And it's okay to ask for help. And the second thing is really enjoy the time that you've got because what I hear from most gym owners is I never have time to work on the business. Now's the time. Absolutely. Now is the time for you to refine what you do and really put oil on all those squeaky wheels that operate in your business. Get all that stuff that you've always wanted to work on, work on it. 
It's the coolest thing that you can do. That's time to do it, isn't it? That's all we've been doing. Absolutely. Um, And the third thing that I I would really emphasise a lot, and that's keep working out yourselves. You know, it's really easy to... And I've seen this in the fitness industry here in Australia. I've heard it in the US, but because I'm not there, I haven't seen it. But I've seen it here in Australia. And that is the fitness industry have a pity party for themselves. We all feel sorry for each other. That doesn't help anybody. That just drags us down. So the easiest way to get out of a, a pit of pity is to stay positive ourselves. The easiest way to stay positive for ourselves is keep working out, keep training, keep exercising, keep moving. You'll also work out how hard it is to do it in a garage, just like your members. Yeah. So this is a really important component that I want us to really think about as owners is getting that balance right between working on the business and making sure we're staying fit and healthy ourselves. Great advice, buddy. Really, really great advice again. Uh, I'd like to finish off by talking a bit, if that's okay, about the initiative you've launched recently um, in Australia. Rather than me ex- explaining it better than hand it over, can I, can I ask you just to talk a bit more about it so I think we can really benefit from it from it here in the UK? Yeah, it was an interesting one. It was, it was actually a global initiative um, that, because i am come up with these crazy-ass ideas, it probably should have just been in Australia, but I... I I tried to make it global and um, it kind of did go global, which was really exciting. And it was just simply, um, it was a non-political message. It was a consumer facing message. And that is that gyms are safe for the consumer to come back to. When a gym follows the guidelines that are set down by the government or health experts, then the gym is safe. And like we said in those data points earlier, if we know 20 to 30% of members are, are worried about coming back, well, we need to get them to come back sooner. So we need them to know that gyms are safe. We also need to, to re-educate people that going to a gym, going to a fitness studio, seeing a personal trainer is not always about weight loss. There are far more health benefits to exercise, build your immunity reduces stress, helps you get through life. Exercise is a preventative medicine. Completely. So the message that we tried to create was a really simple one, which is gyms are safe and exercise is medicine. And we had a really narrow window because, in all honesty, Lawrence, if we gave people six months that we were going to do it, they would have screwed it up. <laughs> so we would have changed and amended and... <laughs> So I let's just keep it really simple. You've got seven days and we're going to launch this. We're going to put this out there. And, and so that's literally what it was. We just asked um, clubs as a brand to post gyms are safe, exercise is medicine. We asked them to get their staff to post that on their, all their social platforms. Yeah. And then we also asked them to go to members and ask members to post that same message. And if we think purely the maths, that if we had every club and 50% of our staff and 25% of our membership base, then both those hashtags would have been a trending topic. And what I did was I implored the entire industry to across the world to debrand for the day, to forget about our marketing strategy for the day, not be capitalist pigs and put a call to action on this but rather just a consumer facing message to build confidence back in our product. And for zero dollars, this literally cost me nothing to put out there and it cost clubs nothing to do. It was a social media grassroots campaign and we saw it proliferate throughout Australia. It was actually pretty cool to see it start in New Zealand because of course they're the closest to the sun coming up at the beginning of the day and it's through just- Australia, through Asia, through the UK, through Europe, and then finally finishing in the US. We obviously didn't get as big a bang for our buck in the US because of what they're going through at the moment. Yeah. Uh, but still clubs did it and staff did it and members did it. And I think it, what it really showed me 
is for the first time since I've been in the industry that the entire industry can unite when we have something to unite behind. And I really feel that a precedent was set on the 1st of June that countries, states, cities, and the world can unite in order to cause an impact, to take an idea and turn it into an action. There is no reason why the UK, when you reopen in, in, in August, cannot have a national fitness week. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be overcomplicated. We just have to give the consumer confidence that our gyms are safe, and then what they do in the gyms is actually really good for their health. And that in itself helps the first responders because they haven't got to worry about heart attacks walking in. They haven't got to worry about COVID-19. They haven't got to worry about adult onset diabetes. That's great for your healthcare system. So, yeah, look, it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot that it is possible to unite our industry. And... Um, on zero dollars nice very good mate look thank you so so much for your time today there's some amazing insights i think we could probably create a series of of, of of tips for people just from this recording alone so thank you so much just before you go i just want to highlight that jt has an excellent podcast is well worth listening to on a regular basis and also your facebook group the active management community contains constantly questions come in from owners and from operators and as a community people come back and help each other out so much guidance and documentation i've seen come through from just that so it's well worth a follow well worth a subscribe it has now over two and a half thousand people on it so it's a phenomenal success so yeah no it's been yeah. pretty cool that you watched that grow nicely yeah absolutely so i'm gonna put a link to it in the comments to this as well but um lastly jt thanks again so much buddy we'll speak again soon thanks for the opportunity Thank thanks Lawrence. Cheers, mate. take care